Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take another look at the arterial waveform. In this video, as opposed to the other one on the basics of the waveform, we're going to take a look specifically at how we set the arterial line up and why, how the signal is conducted from the body to the machine, and damping and their effects. So for starters, and I'm going to label this in black, the tubing, the line is set up using non-compressible tubing unlike what we use in normal IVs. Connected at one end, up here, to our normal saline bag, with then in the middle, our transducer, and then a lower lock down here at the end that connects to the catheter itself. Now, the fluid in the bag up here actually has to be pressurized. People usually do it to 250 to 300 millimeters of mercury. And this is because if the bag wasn't pressurized, your arterial blood pressure would be greater than the pressure in the tubing in the bag, and you would simply get backflow of blood into the tubing. Now, you can see I've kind of drawn a rough sketch here, as all of my drawings are rough sketches, but there'll be another video of me demonstrating setting up an A-line from start to finish. So once we've plugged our tubing into our saline bag, we have to prime it, and that's what I'm drawing this this blue for indicating that we are uh, flushing it with normal saline. And mind you, this is all before we've attached this to our catheter. And we prime it for two reasons. The first is that if you don't prime the line and it's just filled with air, and then it's hooked up to someone's artery, and then you flush it, you would flush in an entire tubing worth of air into someone's artery, which could be disastrous. Now, the other reason this is important is because you won't get an accurate reading if the pressure is being transduced through air instead of through saline or some type of liquid. And that will come up when we discuss dampening, damping soon. So filling the line with saline or fluid makes it so that two fluids that are similar to one another, blood and saline in this case, interface with one another, as opposed to blood and air, which allows propagation of the pressure wave within the blood vessel to then move through the fluid in the tubing towards the transducer. Now inside our transducer here in blue there is a diaphragm and something called a wheat stone bridge. And what the wheat stone bridge is is it's an electrical circuit which converts the pressure signal via change of resistance into an electrical signal. And it does that by, as the diaphragm deforms and bends, it changes the resistance within the transducer and that then puts out an electrical signal that can be read by the computer and give us a number. Now the next thing we need to do before, again, hooking up to a patient is we need to zero the system. And to zero the system, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to turn this three-way stopcock so instead of facing up that way, it's facing this way, closing off the line to the patient, making it so that the transducer is now open here to the air at 760 millimeters of mercury. This allows the transducer and the system to normalize to what is the normal atmospheric pressure. Now, I would like to say, and I'm not exactly sure where it comes from, uh, maybe somebody who watches this can correct me, that we commonly zero the arterial line at the level of the right atrium. And to be honest, I'm not sure why. At the time you're zeroing, you're exposing the arterial line transducer to atmospheric pressure. And it shouldn't be any different if you're at the foot or at the head of the patient so long as you don't then expose the transducer to the patient's blood pressure during that time. So theoretically, I imagine that if you zero at the patient's head, then bring the transducer down to the level of the heart and zero it, it should be the same as if you just zeroed it there to begin with. Again, because you're not exposing the system to the patient's blood pressure, now at any point, you are just exposing it to the atmosphere. But I encourage you to try it and maybe let me know what happens. So now we're ready to start transducing. And the way we do that 
is we're going to go ahead and turn our stopcock back up towards the air here and we're going to go ahead and allow the blood pressure transducer and the entire line to be open up now to the patient that we've hooked our arterial line up to here. Sorry as I kind of draw on our new lines again. So now the entire system is opened up to the patient and we are in fact attached to the patient and now the transducer and the system are exposed to the pressure wave generated here in the radial artery like this that will then propagate into the liquid medium like so up to the transducer. Once it makes contact with the transducer like we mentioned it bends the diaphragm which changes the resistance and as a result changes the output or the electrical output. Now the last thing I want to discuss here is over and under damping. So over damping is the more common of the two so we'll discuss that one first and the way that I think of over damping is that when something in the line acts as a shock absorber. One example here would be air. Air is more compressible than fluid is. If you don't believe me, fill a syringe with air. Just kind of draw back on a plunger. Put your thumb over the top of the syringe and then push the syringe plunger down and see if you can compress it. Do the same thing with a syringe full of saline and you will find it to be much harder. That's because air is less dense than saline and as a result can absorb the energy from the pressure wave traveling through the line kinks in the tubing, blood clots, and compliant tubing, or tubing that is able to expand with the pressure, or with the volume moving through it and decrease its pressure, all serve as sources of overdamping, as they may prevent the wave from being properly propagated. The effects of overdamping result in a slurred waveform, slurred waveform, characteristically low systolic pressures, or peak systolic pressures, and high diastolic pressures. Now, let me go ahead and change the color of under to purple so that we have a different color. Now underdamping, on the other hand, is a result of the pressure wave being transduced too quickly. And this may include stiff, non-compliant tubing, artifact from the catheter, and tachycardias. This results in a falsely elevated systolic peak pressure and a falsely depressed diastolic pressure. So that's all for setting up the line and how the transducer works and some damping. I hope this is clear uh, and I hope it kind of clears things up for everybody. Check in for the next video on arterial lines where we'll talk about how the wave form changes when we cannulate different arterial sites and why. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to email us. If you're interested in getting involved, be sure to let us know. Subscribe below. Follow us on Instagram at countbackwardsfrom10. And stay tuned for the next video.